everyone. We are again here with Dr. Sarkar today. So part two of uh, lumbar spine dysfunction. So Dr. Sagun, uh, you can start the session now. Uh, Dr. Sarkar doesn't need any more introduction as we had introduced him in the previous lecture. That is the first MPT holder from the West Bengal. And that is PhD from the United States government on the scholarship basis. That's the main thing is there. And that's a proud thing for us. Uh, so today, Dr. Sarkar would be taking up the part two of lumbar spine dysfunction. Thank you, sir, Dr. Sarkar. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Very good evening to everyone. Um, again, I would like to extend my thanks to Dr. Shagun Agarwal, Dr. Dharam Pandey, and the entire rehabilitation science. It, uh, as I earlier said, that it's a wonderful platform for you know academicians and research scientists like us to present our knowledge, um, present our understanding over the experience of over two decades probably, um, and then to share whatever we kind of know to improve your understanding, improve your base of support, and then try to stretch the horizon of. Uh, what you think, what you want to be, and what you are trying to achieve uh, as a goal in your uh, career and your clinical practice. Um, I would also like to extend my thanks to Dr. Harpreet Singh. Um, and uh, again, uh, let's get started. Um, so hopefully you were present in the part one of uh, the lumbar spine dysfunction um, you know, lecture or talk. If not, please go to the Rehabilitation Science YouTube page, um, look into their videos. They have some wonderful, wonderful talks going on. Um, and I actually have learned a lot in different other different areas, which are, which are not my cup of tea. And uh, thanks to, again to the Rehabilitation Science Group. Um, also just take a look in part one to have a foundational knowledge of anatomy, biomechanics, and a little bit of apl application of anatomy and biomechanics, and then it will be easier for you to understand today's talk. So without further ado, let's get started. So um, a little bit of brief, if you are new to with me, is that I have a background in biomedical engineering and stuff. Um, I work a lot with surgical biomechanics of shoulder joint per se, but most of uh, you know, large joints uh, is basically what I research on. Um, and then, so essentially my focus is, as I said, since it's biomechanics, so I like to do um, kinematics, um, more so with uh, biplanar x-ray or fluoroscopy, or with uh, marker systems like Vicon cameras. If you, I'm pretty certain you probably have heard about it. And also using accelerometers and gyroscopes and magnetometers. So those are sensors which we place in the different segments of the body and try to calculate the kinematics. Um, I also do a little bit of kinetics, that is the muscle modeling part. Um, there is no instrument or equipment presently to get, um, you know, the physics and the engineering of uh, muscles or soft tissues. We have to create that based on um, kinematics as well as CT scans and MR scans, kind of a wedding between scans, diagnostic imaging, and that of uh, kinematic uh, equipments and merge them in certain softwares that are there available and try to create uh, muscles or design muscles based off of those uh, stuff. So my, my focus for today's lumbar dysfunction is to talk about more um, from diagnostic uh, features and a little bit of treatment principles. Then the reason why I kind of, uh, you know, don't try to teach um, treatments because over the YouTube or over any software medium, what I do may not, you may not perceive the same thing. And if you do something incorrectly, then who is supposed to get the blame, right? So it is, there is, this is like a disclaimer, whatever I'll be showing you is for your information and not for much for you to practice. If you do want to practice and know and understand, I certainly do workshops on osteopathy. You can get in touch with me directly or with the rehabilitation science group like Dr. Agarwal, Dr. Pandey, or Dr. Singh, and they will be able to guide you to, in the right direction. All right, so um, learning objectives is pretty much the same from uh, last uh, part one of the lecture. We are essentially doing like a storytelling, as I said earlier, and try to uh, give you some important nuances, important aspects of what you need to know to improve your ability to diagnose. My pet peeve 
is my pet peeve is obviously a little bit of an American lingo, meaning whatever I like, my philosophy is basically to for you to understand the importance of diagnosis. And for example, I mentioned earlier that low back pain to me is not a diagnosis because pain is symptomatic. So pain is subjective. So it's a symptom for me, right? And for you too. And low back is the area or location of the pain. So location of the pain, low back pain. So it doesn't give me any idea about what actually is going on inside um, or within the you know, lumbar spine area. So my, my, my thought process and in, in terms of the osteopathic school of thought is to, you need to be really strong in terms of your diagnosis. And there are hundreds and hundreds of treatment guidelines and principles that you can certainly follow and um, get the outcome that you want to achieve from your patient. The other, one other thing that I have uh, noticed over the past year that I'm in India is that people think that once the, once the treatment session, like, I don't know, 10 days or 14 days is over and the patient feels good, that's successful. To me, success actually defines something different. To me, success defines in the long run, if the patient is coming back to me within six months of time period, then I am not successful. My treatment is not successful. My, my, the goal that I try to achieve, it's not that 100% of the time I am successful. It is impossible, right? We are all humans at the end of the day. Um, so the, the thought process that goes in when a patient comes to me and I treat and with, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, with time, with progression, the symptoms reduce. I, and I always say symptoms are not pain because for, for me, pain is a little bit different. Um, so symptoms reduce and that reduction in symptoms should be consistent for a long a period of time, at least over six months or so. If it is not, and the, if the patient comes back to me within a six month period of time, I have to rethink my approach. If it is possible, I will try to remove that individual so that the, uh, the symptoms do not come back within six months. Period. Uh, but if I fail to do so, then probably I'll refer to somebody who is better than me. Um, so with that thought process in mind, I'll give you a little bit of uh, what to expect today, which essentially means the contents of the today's webinar, like a book, uh, what do you expect? So we already discussed about anatomy, clinical biomechanics. I'll do very briefly about red flags and clinical examination, cluster analysis, decision, decision making rules, and a little bit of clinical prediction rules and end up with treatment guidelines and principles. And then the, uh, there will be an open forum for you to ask me questions if you have any. So now, whenever we talk about a low back pain, pain is not just ooh and ah. Pain has so many variables that is extremely difficult for me to kind of you know, define in one class. And you all have probably seen or read some bits and pieces of Melzac and Wall. They, they are like the book Bible of uh, you know, a pain, right? And you know that Melzac and Wall's book is more than like 2000 pages or so. So pain by itself means a lot. And it's not just the physiological part or of pain. There is social structure to pain. There is um, you know, psych psychological aspect of pain. There is environmental predictability. Dr. Sarkar, we can't hear you. <clears throat> it is the perception of pain because Sorry, I got disconnected. Give me just a second for me to share the screen. All right, I think we are good. So what I was saying is essentially um, pain is basically uh, you know, have lots of lots and lots of variables, and it is very difficult for us at this point of time, with the constraints of time, uh, to define exactly what pain is. But as this picture should be, if you were in part one, this picture should be give you a little bit of a drift or drive as to where who can have back 
pain or back uh, pathology. So anyone in the age spectrum, anyone who has uh, problems in you know, doing exercise, even exercise failure to provide current guidelines for exercise can also lead to pain like this individual. You know, so you need to be extra cautious that your exercise prescription do not cause exacerbation of, you know, the, the symptoms. So you need to be very much aware of that. This was actually the last slide that we discussed from last um, part one. And this basically brings home the kinetics part of the lumbar spine, which does not only you know uh, have muscles of the back the muscles of the side abdomen rectus from rectus abdominis to transversus abdominis quadratus lumborum and the thoracolumbar fascia all every soft tissue is involved in the painful pathology of uh, low back pain or lumbar spine dysfunction so now let's jump to you know more uh, physiological aspect of causes now as you can see there are two pie charts and the pie chart to your left you know more than 80% more than 80% of the low back pain causes are either mechanical 42% lumbar radicular so let's say pinched nerve like for example sciatica and then discogenic, disc bulge, disc herniation, disc sequestration, and all the grades of, you know, um, discitis. So all these, these three diagnoses or causations are accumulative or summated to more than 80%. So think of that. So if 10 patients of low back pain visit you daily, so at least eight, if not more, nine will have either low back, uh, you know, back mechanical derangement or discitis or lumbar radicular pinch nerve or any other neural impingement. In fact, look at the pie chart to your right. The blue area, which is way over 50%, is nothing but non-specific low back pain. And in the in the constraints of chiropractic and osteopathy and also manual therapists, like there are uh, big organizations that teach to do workshops in America in uh, manual therapy like NAOMT and Evidence in Motion. And there are uh, a couple more like uh, Institute of Physical Arts, IPA. Um, they are big in teaching manual therapy um, to uh, PTs, these four organizations. and. So in, from that, that realm or that niche area, non-specific low back pain is usually more mechanical derangements or dysfunction, right? Mechanical derangement or dysfunction. So anything, when a, you read a prescription having low back pain, and if that individual has no other anomaly, suddenly there is low back pain, maybe it's chronic, but that's the first episode that individual has, highly likely, again, highly likely that individual, that low back you know, symptoms is arising from a mechanical derangement or dysfunction. All right, let's go to the next slide. Risk factors, I, you can go ahead and read through it. I don't want to you know, bore yourself, either me or you, just by reading through stuff. Backpack overload is in red, and please do uh, be aware of backpack is other than school bag syndrome. I'm sure you have heard about school bag syndrome, and it's nothing but heavy load that is being carried by uh, your, your, the ch children or teens or adolescents during the school days or, you know, uh, from thoracic pain to lumbar pain to neck pain to shoulder pain. There are many variables that predispose uh, spinal pain due to backpack overload. So you need to be aware of that kind of episode. Has it ever happened in your client during the teenage adolescent age group? And then he was fine, but suddenly again in young adult or middle mid group of adult again that records so there could be a link or a correlation between backpack overload when that individual was young and then in the older not relatively older but you know like around 50s 45 maybe the, again he has introduction or um, accentuation of uh, back pain all right now, one of my favorites, right? Because um, since I am an osteopath and then the osteopathic diagnosis is basically, I don't want to go into potentially serious because you will rarely have individuals coming in with potentially serious uh, involvement like fractures or tumors and the like open wounds. I, I doubt you will be able to 
come across this obviously if you have this condition or if some it, uh, the patient has this condition he or she needs to be referred immediately to the emergency or um, to the uh, respective healthcare professional the two things that is extremely common for us is I'll jump to the non-specific one, which actually means mechanical back pain. The type of the back pain is the most common presentation, as you had seen in the pie chart earlier, right? And so essentially, it includes pain for where there is no identifiable cause. It just there is pain, and that could be because of gait pattern, that could be because of bad posture, that could be because of just sleeping habits, that could be because habits, work habits, um, emotional habits. There are lots of other variables that leads to non-specific pain. But again, they can all be grouped under mechanical back pain, which is basically you can ameliorate. Amelioration means reduction in signs and symptoms um, of uh, back pain originating from me mechanical derangements or dysfunction. That's number, basically that's number one, top priority from, uh, from uh, allied healthcare professionals like an osteopath, chiropractor, and obviously PTs. And a, a, a second one is nerve root problem. Anything that is pinched or compressed, especially, you know, uh, lumbar uh, sciatica and stuff, that can also lead to, um, you know, radicular pain or radicular signs and symptoms. Obviously, I'm not going into herniated disc, listhesis and stenosis, because you guys know that comes under that neuromechanical problems. The one, so the non-specific one is purely mechanical. Neural problem is more neuromechanical issues. Now, you have all those red flags. Again, you can read through it, but the possible causes of red flags can be as simple as lumbar disc herniation and or mechanical origin to as complex as metastatic carcinoma or infection. Now, this is where your diagnosis will you know, be the foundation for the treatment. So if an individual with these symptoms comes and you say, ah, red flag, I will not treat him or her and just blankly refer it to the concerned healthcare professional. I don't think that we are doing justice to the patient, to the society, to the community. You are there, uh, you know, like the first contact healthcare professional well, from you, the patient has lots and lots of expectation. You need to have proper, you know, base of support and foundational knowledge to really hone in if that's, there is some infection going on or if it's just the pain from mechanical origin. It's just that they are, the mechanical origin pain is also going up, radiating up to the thoracic spine and then obviously the ribs are not. So this is just giving you an idea just because there are red flags don't just shut the door on the face of your patients. No, try to understand the diagnosis first. And then obviously if it's irreparable, you certainly refer. If not, then try to control with the best, best practice methods that you know, that you learned, that you have learned and in your expertise and try to control the pain to the best of your um, you know, abilities. Okay. So clinical examination guidelines. I was talking to Dr. Uh, you know, Pandey and Dr. Agarwal uh, you know, uh, like last couple of days back. Um, and then we were talking about clinical and also Dr. Harpreet Singh. Um, uh, and uh, we were talking about clinical examination guidelines. So clinical examination guidelines was um, you know, published around research around for four or five years, published around 2015, 2016. It was um, you know, spread out and trial and error method. And then in 2017, um, it is kind of prescribed now for most in America uh, healthcare you know, facilities to use these clinical examination guidelines. So obviously when you inspect an individual, postural alignment, both static and dy dynamic is essential. And, I don't want to go through it because I know as a student, you already know how to do that postural um, posture examination and evaluation. Um, other skin changes, swelling and stuff, certainly you go ahead and take a look. You can certainly see symmetry, symmetry of the two sides of the body to check for atrophy and other anomalies, abnormalities, and my favorite, gait. I was uh, you know, uh, talking the other day to a couple other individuals and said that even that if someone comes with a locked jaw, I always see the patient, how he or she walks. Because for me, I try to evaluate holistically um, because uh, 
the, the way that I have been taught over the past two decades or more than two decades actually, this is how I have developed myself and try to look at the patient and try and evaluate going up the chain or down the chain, whatever I feel is necessary for that individual and try to see the differences or if there are any anomalies present or not. Um, palpation, da 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 da, you know all the stuff, alignment. Always try to check the lumbar spinous processes with sacrum and the thoracic spine. That's the most basic sort of alignment, spinal alignment you would be able to evaluate without the diagnostic imaging like x-rays and um, scans, right? And MR scans essentially. So you need to do, uh, do a double check of um, the thoracic spine one level up and one level down the sacrum and the pelvis together. Obviously check for muscle tone. And then the left column right over here, this is under the clinical examination guidelines. This is not, this is the osteopathic variation that the school, American school of osteopathy has, uh, you know, uh, come about and said that, okay, why don't we use the method called acronym called TAR. TART is nothing but tenderness, as asymmetry, ROM, and tissue texture change. Tenderness, you know, localized pain, pain on pressure, you press and the uh, patient says, ah, you know there is the present or absence of tenderness. Now, asymmetry. Asymmetry is essentially structural. So let's say, for example, if I try to bend down, if I try to bend forwards or extend my back, I am trying to check side to side motion, how the motion is based on the right side to the left, the mirror image. I am trying to evaluate the side to side variations with asymmetry. If there is presence or absence of asymmetry or not, let's say for example, I am exaggerating, I am forward bending and I am doing this. Obviously there is asymmetry. And I would, if the individual you know, presents with low back pain, I probably know which lumbar disc or which lumbar vertebrae has any issues that is causing this rotation, right? I don't want to go into ERSs and FRSs because again, this is for basic students and I want to only focus uh, my teaching today for the students who are still um, trying to graduate. So again, so that's the asymmetry part when you kind of bend in a very, very different main uh, non-planner or un, you know, multi-planar motion, it is not in the same flexion extension sagittal plane, right? Flexion extension is in this plane. And if someone does this, obviously that's not in the sagittal plane. As a result, there is asymmetry, which is obviously a structural cause. Now structure doesn't mean just uh, you know, bone. It can also mean soft tissues. And for me, soft tissues fall under two categories. The first category is your contractile element, which is nothing but muscle. The second element is your non-contractile elements. Those are will be your ligaments, tendons, you know, other cartilaginous tissue. And but fascia will be a little bit different. Fascia are in, in here in India we say fascia is basically structurally it's a non-contractile unit, but functionally it is a contractile unit. And we can discuss uh, later on as to what I mean by this, but I'll repeat it one more time so that you can write it down. A
sorry everyone uh, there was some problem with dr sarkar's internet so he'll be right back stay tuned we are calling him Hello, everyone. Sorry, I just don't know what just happened, but let's, um, I'll repeat certainly. Sorry about that. My apologies for the connection that just went off, and I don't know what, what to do about it. All right, let's get uh, going. So, essentially, where we were is basically I was talking about asymmetry. Now, let's jump into range of motion. Now, range of motion is Hopefully you can all see. Um, otherwise, uh, Dr. Uh, Pandey, Dr. Agarwal, or Dr. Singh, please uh, ping me to say if there are any uh, disturbances from my end or not. Um, so essentially what we are looking at is a range of motion. We always use GONI to measure range of motion, but that's basically the quantity of range of motion available in the joint uh, per se. But to me, that doesn't give me the entire picture, right? Range of motion just by measuring does not give me the exact entire picture. The quality of motion and if there are any alterations to the range of motion is also very, very critical for me. And what do we mean by that? Quality means like if the flexion is smooth, if the forward bending is smooth or it is like this. Tuck, 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 tuck. So essentially, if it is like a cog wheel, as if someone who has rigidity in Parkinson's will not be able to move. I am able to attain the complete range of motion, but my motion is not fluid, not smooth. And I will make a note of that. Also alteration. So I should be going through a sagittal plane for flexion extension. But for some reason, I do this and come back to midline, or I completely try to get my you know, lumbar forward bend range of motion, but in one angle, out of plane motion. So any motion that is out of plane and you are still able to achieve complete range of motion, I'll mark it down. And that is essentially alteration in the motion, meaning if it is out of plane or in plane, quality of motion how smooth your motion is when you are bending forward or you are extending or rotating or side bending whatever joint you know motion you um, measure with a goni don't just go for quantity try to check the quality of motion and alteration or planar check the planar motion or present or not if the motion is in plane or out of plane and lastly tissue texture change one of my favorites so what do I mean by that? So let's say I am the you know uh, you know the, the doctor who's trying to um, check the musculature of and what's going on with the low back. I will stand behind and ask the patient to bend forward. I am standing behind. So when the patient bends forward, I will like to see a bird's eye view. Bird's eye view. So the patient is bending. I'm seeing a bird's eye view of the low back spine. If one side is elevated or the other side is depressed, I will try to make a note. Usually, normally, if one side is elevated on the you know, lateral to the spinous processes where your erectors are, that means your erectors are hypertrophied. Your erectors are tight. Your erectors might maybe you know, be in you know, contracted phase most of the time. So contracture, um, tightness, Hypertrophy actually leads to more painful spasm and other symptoms. So any elevation or depression of the soft tissue structures is called tissue texture change. And that's the change that you are trying to note it down in your clinical diagnosis. 
extremely important but easy to remember chart so essentially these are the four criteria from osteopathic examination principles that you can incorporate in your examination a routine examination and evaluation guidelines doesn't make sense all right cluster analysis now it is nothing new for you it's just that cluster is together when you analyze a structure with one orthopedic test the specificity the sensitivity and your reliability and validity is pretty low with that meaning you actually may be testing for you know let's say a drawers anterior drawers test for the knee joint meniscus right? oh, sorry acl and you do just the drawers test the, the if the result is positive you actually are not 100% sure or if there is acl rupture tear or any pathology going on you have to do a minimum of three tests to actually come to a conclusion if if it is what you find what you are intending to find so cluster analysis is similarly the cluster of tests performed for one particular structure and the the more the positive or the more the the pathological that structure is based on the test more strong is your belief in terms of the diagnosis so cluster analysis helps to improve the validity specificity sensitivity you know reliability all the psychometrics and clinometric properties of a test that increases that because it's a group of testing that you are doing so you are observing the body type facial expression and all the stuff you know range of motion when you are doing it actively passively passive with over pressures and stuff you know motor function motor function is you are checking for flexibility strength and certainly function now when i talk about function i am not talking about oh just reaching the ground forward bending and backward bending i actually give them a task maybe the task is to pick up something from the floor maybe the task is to reach something like you know grab on to a bottle which is in the shelf that is at a higher end or have to reach forward so any function that is difficult for the patient to do in activities of daily living should come under function for you to test so that you know exactly what is happening in the back in the to the for today's webinar and you can certainly do it for any joint per se and try to check if there are any functional issues going on or not now i actually jumped the first bullet point and that's the control part motor control is what you have to test and that is basically testing the pattern of a soft tissues in this case muscle if the muscle is moving how it should be moving if the muscle is contracting or relaxing how and when it should contract and relax so there are lots and lots of philosophies um hypotheses based and postulates based on motor control theories and you can use those postulates and principles to help understand the motor control of the muscles of the entire body system now that's the left side now when we come to movement patterns that's also one of uh, you know a, a schools of a osteopathic schools of thought critical information piece that you need to take movement patterns how does the patient enter the room how is he or she walking towards you if there is any problem while the patient is sitting or if there are any other symptoms while the patient is getting up if the you know the leg length is you do a gait evaluation so if there is any differences in gait length in cadence cadence is what the speed of walking what the what should be the normal speed based on the specific age um gender and other variables you can certainly google search and get that list and if the speed is less then there probably could be a problem in the entire chain of the human body and you have to localize that um also what else is there all right yes Pel pelvic shift pelvic tilt so we i love to teach the biomechanics of the pelvis like this way the pelvis moves in this direction or tilt right so rotate and tilt and then rotate this way also three dimensional three axis motion xyz and again xyz and then there are euler and cardan angles which 
you can basically do some matrix multiplication and basically get the information of how much the pelvis is moving anteriorly tilt and posteriorly tilt and all other uh, two axis systems that you can work on based on biomedical uh, biomechanical modeling um so coming back to movement patterns is you have to assess pelvis motion if there is a dysfunction in the lumbar segment obviously you want to check for sacral nutation counter nutation but you also need to check for pelvis motion okay all right now coming back to cluster analysis basically you have and i'm not going to do all these tests either you have already done these tests you probably are reading maggi and you probably most of the tests are in maggi or if not then you can certainly go across to youtube and find vast resources in terms of understanding any of these tests but for me what i need you to know is don't just do simple slrs do nerve biases for slrs like let's say you ask to you know do slrs and ask your patient obviously i need to be laying down completely but if i do that i won't be able to talk to you guys so i am in a long sitting kind of position i i raise my um leg usually i do it passively which i found more um you know more um positive uh, you know value than doing it actively but it could be variable and i don't actually care if you do it actively or passively but anyway so when you just raise the leg it may you know give you an idea that the patient probably has pain over here or in the butt area but that does not give you an idea actually what is happening so if you so let's for example if this is the leg i do hip flexion and a little bit of adduction 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 towards the midline and raise it it will actually bias more towards the sciatic and tibial nerve for and if i do not just simple dorsiflexion of the foot i do dorsiflexion of the foot and invert it invert it and then do an slr it will bias the sural nerve and if i invert it it will again bias the peroneal nerve actually i'm sorry it's not the peroneal it's actually the tibial nerve so sural nerve inversion and your tibial nerve eversion with dorsiflexion eversion and you do an slr then you are biasing for those nerves and if it is positive now you know the nerve root which actually is pathological rather than the entire lumbar spine does that make sense and you now know which part of the sciatic nerve is actually creating problem and you can do your neurodynamics for that specific nerve also people say slr and you know a patient will say i have pain over here well obviously if someone is who is you know in the elderly group over 60 65 years they will certainly will have hamstring tightness but how do you check for hamstring tightness i have seen people you know straighten up the leg and that is okay i like this test where i am hovering my mouse the 1990 straight leg raise test and it's extremely simple laying down both knees both hips are flexed at 90 knees at 90 ask the patient ask the patient to hold the thigh over here to support the hip joint at 90 and ask one ask them to straighten one leg up down up down and feel for where the tightness is right 90 90 ask the patient to lift or straighten one knee at a time and check if there is tightness that's a easy way of checking for hamstring tightness or not so i love this 90 90 SLRT. Um, I also do stork, and stork sometimes is good. Sometimes there I do certain other testings, and which is very very osteopathic uh, way of doing it. And I teach those specific tests for uh, sacral sulcus, base of the sacral sacrum, how to test the the inclination, declination, and slides of that deep in my workshops. If you are interested in that. so i check for those and not just stor because stor gives me an understanding of how the innominate is moving and the sacral sacrum is kind of moving but not in its entirety so it's a good test but not in its entirety so that's why you need cluster analysis make sense all right um rest of the stuff you essentially know test for posterior lumbar spine in so all these lumbar spine anti and posterior instability are nothing what you do from maitland's mobilization technique 
PA, CPA, UPA, translatory glides, you just check those and feel that and try to appreciate the changes in the end field if it is more or less and vice versa. Okay, so now from that, we are talking about decision-making rules. Now, unfortunately for lumbar spine being so much variable and is clinically difficult to predict the causation till date, till last night, there is no published report on how you can decide um, on a diagnosis based on testing. So there is not, there is no support of the use of clinical prediction rules in the management of non-specific LBP. Current body of evidence does not enable confident direct clinical application of any of the identified rules. Obviously one is in 2013, another is in 2012, but even then it's been seven, eight years down the line, but even then till now we do not have any decision-making rules to predict a pathology based on what? Based on cluster analysis. So cluster analysis, with the help of cluster analysis, you can decide on the type of diagnosis based on LBP. Right now, there are no current literature body to help us diagnose a painful you know, symptom from a lumbar spine or low back to help us understand what's going on in the lumbar spine. Outcome measures. Now, I know it's uh, especially in clinics and in maybe in hospital setting, other than academia, outcome measures are a rarity. I'm, I might be wrong in where you are from, but at least where I am from in India, outcome measures are rarely done. So one of my, they, so here we have how many, let's count it out. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Now. Seven outcome measures are not end all be all. There are probably hundreds of outcome measures, either specific to low back category or generic to low back category. It could be specific to some pathology of the low back or generic to low back or the spine. But there are humongous amount of outcome measures. Why did I have these only seven? These seven have the best psychometrics and kinematic properties meaning their out, the validity and the reliability of the out, these outcome measures are the highest. Of that, I have four in one paragraph and these three in the second paragraph. These four are easy because these four are very simple for the patient to understand. That's why these four are the most commonly used outcome measure for low back pain globally, period. That's it. Out of these four, the Quebec one, Quebec back pain disability scale, the second one is not highlighted in red because this, you as a healthcare professional have to score the uh, questionnaire. And I hate that. It's not that I, I you know, don't like to do outcome measure. I don't have the time to do outcome measure. It is better for me to, for the patient to do the outcome measure for me or fill in the questionnaire. So these three guys, which are highlighted in red, the patient himself or herself can fill in, okay? So the FABQ, the ODI, and the RMDQ, these three outcome measures, the patient himself or herself can fill it up. And that is, you know, a be better way of utilizing my time and the patient's time too. About the Quebec one, the patient, the patient will not be able to fill it. You have to fill it for the patient because there are other testings that you need to do. Now, as you can read, ODI is for severe back pain. RMDQ is between from mild to moderate back pain. So depending on the pain scale, NPR rating between zero and 10, if you feel that the pain is really severe, use ODI. If not, then use RMDQ. But I always use FABQ. FABQ is fear avoidance. And as I told you initially, pain is actually like a misnomer because pain by itself is so subjective, so variable. It has so many components involved just by understanding the physiological aspect of pain will probably give you 25% of what actually pain means. So FabQ gives me a little bit of more idea about the psychosomatic health of the patient or the client to, for me to understand 
where you know the patient's uh, fear of pain or experience of pain is in the structure. So I, in my mind, I know, okay, that guy has really high threshold. If I push him or her, I know he will be able to overcome, uh, overcome the painful symptoms. But if FAPQ score is low, I know the threshold for him, let's, uh, for, for that guy is really low. I have to be extra cautious. I have to really take care of the patient's psychology and understand the in home environment, work environment, social environment, and the economic environment of that patient to understand where this dysfunction is more than the mechanical origin or let's say the physiological anatomical origin of pain. So fact, so research, the minimum of two outcome measures are used and ODI FabQ or RMDQ FabQ is the most commonest that you will come across in our research papers and articles. Okay. As I said, because CPR is so much variable, CPR is so much variable that is clinical prediction rule is very difficult for uh, you to predict. And since we don't have much of decision-making rules, so cluster analysis helps us to decide on the diagnosis and we have an outcome measure. So cluster analysis, decision-making rules actually help in clinical prediction rules. Now, clinical prediction rules can help us to diagnose a pathology and treat a pathology. Diagnosis can be done with the help of CPRs and prescriptive, prescriptive or what type of intervention is needed to cure, quote unquote, cure. I don't believe there is, should be a word cure because it is highly unlikely that we can cure something. Um, so anyway, that's my, my opinion. Again, you don't have to take it. Um, so essentially you have the diagnostic part and you have the prescriptive or intervention or treatment part of CPR. Now, there is only one such CPR right now and that's manipulation for low back pain. If the low back pain is lasting less than 16 days, no symptoms distal to the knee, even though it could have radicular signs, but the radicular signs have to be limited till the knee joint. FabQ scores are less than 19, IR of greater than 35 degrees at least in one hip and hypermobility at least one level of lumbar spine. So you have five criteria. If you have, if your patient falls under these five criteria, falls under these five criteria, then you can manipulate to give, get a positive outcome of reduction of sign and symptom in low back pain patient. Does that make sense? So these five criteria needs to be within your low back pain patient to give manipulation and get the outcome you want your patient to have, which essentially means not only reduction in pain symptom, but also improved range of motion, also improved functional characteristics. All right, good. Now, as I said, I don't like to you know, give treatments and show treatments essentially, uh, but I will give you the guidelines and principles needed for you to uh, construct and reconstruct treatment by your own. So there are two things that you have to remember. So hammer it in your gray cell so that you never ever forget this, okay? So the first thing when you are doing treatment, you need to be having an idea what my patient wants and what my patient's goal and aim is. So usually, no hard and fast rule. Usually you improve mobility, then go for stability, then go for control, mobility, and ultimately function. But if the patient has a fracture, if the patient has an unstable joint, would you start with mobility? Obviously not. Because you want that patient to be that that uh, joint or that structure to be stable first. So you intervene from stability, then you can go in from control mobility, then jump into mobility and function. So you can interchange and play these four variables a little bit, but overall globally, mobility, stability, control mobility, and function is the key for treatment. Um, treatment guidelines. Now, exercise prescription. Exercise prescription, as I said, I don't, I have, probably I have never 
you know, given exercises to my patient to just strengthen from day one, because if the patient is able to come into my clinic, I for sure know that the patient's muscle strength, muscle score is at least four, if not four, over four on five, right? Grading score of when you say zero being um, like anti gravity, no, cannot have any muscular contraction. Five on five is normal. In that scale, I am saying, if the patient walks in, probably he has four, if not more uh, score on, on five. So I don't have any reason to provide him more strength, but I always start with motor control exercises and guidelines. And then I apply strength within phases and then endurance and ultimately if he or she is an athlete, then I go for agility. Otherwise I stop at endurance for most of my clients who are elderly and who don't need to go into Olympics rather than watching it over the TV, right? So the treatment guidelines, if it's for joint, usually do high velocity. Again, treatment guidelines is giving an overview. Again, this is not an end all be all thing. Usually to you know, improve joint function, you give high velocity. That does not mean you have to give high velocity or there is no other treatment possible. There are multiple other treatments that are treatment uh, schools of thought that you can certainly apply to improve joint function. Same with fascia, MFR. I actually do certain other things called ART. You know, that's active release technique. Um, active release technique is a form or the finer form of MFR by founded the principles of active release techniques or ART was founded by Dr. Lehi, a chiropractor around the mid 1990s. So I use ART mostly for fascia and sometimes I use ISTM tools also to improve the diagnostic value, to improve the mobility of the fascial structure and muscle. I generally do MET because MET was created by Dr. Fred Mitchell who was an osteopath in the 1945-50 you know, uh, year group, so post-World War II, essentially. I think it was 1948 when he postulated, uh, Dr. Fred Mitchell postulated uh, MET. And then for nerve, obviously, you have neurodynamics that you can do. Now, I have... said that I use uh, I you uh, I really am sorry I have no idea why it's doing what it's doing today it usually is not this bad so please guys hope you are having that much of patience so again sorry about that now I'll show you a little bit of motor control exercises so be be with me as I said initially, motor control exercise is not high, you know, gross motion, high velocity, very dynamic, it is not. So you actually are trying to, you know, create improvement in patterns, motion patterns by soft tissues. So for example, if someone has low back pain, I actually do start with this kind of exercise. So I am laying on my tummy, with my hand in the Y position, Y position. So let's say about 45 degree position. And then if I do this, that's more of a strength training, you know, strengthening sort of muscle activation. I don't want that. I want extremely small and short amplitude or burst of muscle contraction that I want the patient to feel for it, feel it, okay? and. He or she needs to imagine what's going on. That is extremely essential in motor control. So this is one type of feed forward mechanism, again, postulated by Shamway Cook and Marjorie Bullagat. Um, so they actually have this feed forward loop, which we as an you know, uh, osteopath, let's say, use it. So I usually ask my patients to lower their arm, 
bring it right up to over here, which is essentially parallel to the body. I never, I never go higher up than the body. When you go higher up the body, then you are contracting the muscles. I don't want that. I want a relative contraction from stretch position to neutral, stretch position to neutral. By doing this, you are actually engaging not the same side erectors, especially the one in the deepest layer, the multifidus, the rotator is the semispinalis. You are actually activating the opposite side. So this is my left side. When I'm raising my left arm, which is parallel, now my arm is parallel to the body, I am actually activating the right side erectors. And if you, I can, in my workshop, I show you how you can palpate these musculatures, like you can palpate multipedus, especially if that individual is not a higher BMI, you can certainly do that. And then also I'll be able to make you understand how the longissimus, the semi, the spinalis actually contracts and you can feel for that. The opposite side should fire first and that's what the training is all about. Correct patterning. Now, if you ask me why the opposite side, you know, uh, fires first, I will not give that answer to you. You have to figure out that for yourself by checking into PubMed, Google Scholar or Web of Science. Web of Science is one of my, one, my favorite, my go-to to check for, um, you know, journals and articles. So that's one type of motor control. Then, if you remember from the first slide picture, that cat, camel, cat, dog, bird, dog, or whatever, you know, essentially this and this. Very, very common exercise that we give to patients with a multi, multiple types of spinal, uh, you know, dysfunction. But most of that is, uh, sorry to say, but is incorrect. One, the reason why is, if you start by doing too much and too, you know, contraction and relaxation or stretching of the muscles, the action potential will actually reduce and also the activation pattern will be completely, you know, disrupted. So what you have to do is in this, in this position, you have to ask your patient to ever so slightly stretch and come back to neutral spine of the lumbar stretch and come back to neutral spine. Do not ask your patient to go as far down so that the belly button kind of touches the floor or in this case, the table. Never say that. If you do that, you are actually activating more hypertonicity in the lumbar erectors and they will again fire too much and the pain may not be able to go away in, when, in long duration of time. Again, see, my, my thought process again is, I don't want the patient to come back to me at in six months time. I don't. I want him or her to have that pain-free or symptom-free uh, life for at least six or more months for me to be successful in what I do, right? So I, again, re repetition. You can do a little bit of stretch, come back to neutral spine neutral spine which is basically the lumbar spine is real straight and that's where you try to build up the control of the uh, deepest layers of muscles which essentially means those three guys rotatoris multifidus and semispinalis now these three muscles are stabilizers we talked about it in last um, you know lecture or talk these are stabilizers if you don't have the spine that is stable and try to strengthen where do you think or how do you think the spine will be able to correct itself, right? It doesn't make sense. So you always have to stabilize the spine with the help of motor control exercises to help you guide through the process of control mobility function, right? And then strength and endurance too. Now, uh, two things. What I did not talk about in, in my treatment principle, I use a gym ball, gym ball, and ask the patient to sit. So obviously a gym ball will be wobbly, wobbly. If the patient sits, I ask him to feel for the neutral spine. That's for me is a diagnosis and a treatment. And there are various phases or levels of how you can achieve neutral spine from motor control to strength to endurance of neutral spine. 
but for me i have to ask my patient and feel where the neutral spine is the patient needs to know where the neutral spine is and the best way not the best way but the most simple and the easy and less time way is to make him or her sit on a gym ball and move the pelvis and ask him where he or she feels that he or she is sitting erect that erect posture that feeling of erect posture is his or her neutral spine to achieve neutrality of spine and to maintain that one your patient can do pelvic clock exercise one of my very very go to before even starting with the core i ask my patients to do pelvic clock exercises which essentially means if this is my navel 12 o'clock 3 o'clock 6 o'clock and nine o'clock i ask my patient laying down obviously and i ask my patient to think and try to bring the belly button towards 12 o'clock three o'clock six o'clock and nine o'clock and then circle it and then reverse it and there are many other levels for that but that's my very first level of core control when you say core you give plank and you give those which are correct which you are doing a good job but that's not my go to not my first thing i actually have to feel for the activation pattern i actually have to see the contraction if they are occurring when it should occur those are the things you have, there are many emg needle emg studies i mean you can easily come across um, in the on the net and you can actually understand what how pelvic clock exercises work another thing HEP is nothing but home exercise program and home exercise program is essentially I don't prescribe based on research principles starting with Freud who used to believe that if you get too much of information there will be a khichri there will be a completely jumbled up mess in your frontal cortex so four to eight exercises per phase is optimum I don't usually give more than four to six exercises Four is my go-to. Six actually is the higher limit. I usually don't give more than eight exercises. I have probably never given eight exercises at one go. So depending on your client's requirement, go based on goal and aims, you should be varying the ex home exercise program between four and six. And I give various types of exercises, not just motor control exercises I showed you guys. I also give self-treatment in high velocity. They can do manipulate in certain ways to actually crack a little bit. Again, I don't like the word crack because that's again, to me, doesn't give, make any sense. But I try to help them mobilize by themselves in certain positions and postures. All right, so hopefully this helps you a little bit in understanding what to follow in terms of treatment guidelines because treatment is endless and all treatments are not the best just because i know something doesn't mean i know everything and learning is endless every day is a new day every time you learn something new i am also still in the learning and developing phase so these are the principles and guidelines I shared with you. If you need to or want to or have the urge to learn more, certainly feel free to you know, connect with me. Um, and um, we, I, as I said, I do workshops and we can um, you know, talk about that ends on. And lastly, take home message is basically after you go back home and you are checking your YouTube and maybe you have a low back pain patient and you are don't want to go through the entire slide sequence what do you need to know just know where how you can differential diagnose pain patterns do a little bit of cluster analysis the osteopathic variations of tart go a little bit of outcome measures cprs and then the treatment principles and that should give you a head start from you know at a very good level to make a better outcome for your patient overall and a long-term life. All right, so these are the resources I had used. This is my contact information. If you are, you do, if you are watching through a, a cell phone, smartphone, do a screen grab, screenshot. If not, if you laptop or tablet, make a, take a picture of this thing, or I mean, you, it will be there in the YouTube also in the Rehabilitation Science Group page. So you can check this anytime out. I have my WhatsApp number and then you can, I have the website too. All right, I will actually stop sharing and so that you can ask me questions and I'll be happy to satisfy your 
hunger. All right, I am good. Uh, a very good evening, Dr. Sarkar. Very good evening, yeah, Dr. Harpreet. Yeah, we are very late in the evening today and uh, thankful to you for giving us so much time and an extensive, uh, uh, what do you say, knowledge about the lumbar spine dysfunctions, uh, going to the cluster analysis, the clinical prediction rules, uh, how to use the outcome measures, and even a, a small practical demonstration of your favorite exercises. So we are uh, really thankful to you for sharing this knowledge. Uh, there was just a small question for today that uh, when would you not like uh, to uh, see the patient or when would you say that uh, uh, you don't need treatment? So what, what do you see in your patients? Right. That's a great question, Dr. Singh. I mean, there's a lot of variability involved, but you are so right. Um, pain is not my primary go-to to diagnose a patient. I always try to check the motion and the mobility. For me, even before that, history gives me a whole lot of idea as to what's going on. So what I did not say, and probably I should have, you one needs a clinician needs to have patience to hear the story of the from the patient so that he can get an idea of what is happening because his history is his story that's where history is coming from so that his story is actually immensely important because in us we follow a protocol called hoac hypothesis originating algorithm so that algorithm, the fundamental principle of that algorithm is you have to listen to what the patient is saying. And in your brain, you are processing what is important, what is justifiable, and what is not. You kind of uh, having it in the side burner. When, when something is important, by the end of history taking, you should have probably six differential diagnoses. From that six differential diagnoses, then you check out the red flags out. From that red flags out, you have your cluster analysis. By the end of cluster analysis, probably you should have two or three diagnoses. So you're dropping by 50% from six to an average of three. After you do your decision-making rules, clinical prediction rules, and a little bit of outcome measure, you come to probably one, if not two maximum diagnoses. And based off of that, I decide, yes, that this is my patient, or no, this is not my patient. You have to be referred to some other healthcare professionals. Right. Hope I was able to uh, answer your query. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, just welcome. one more thing that uh, yeah. we have had two long and fruitful sessions with you. So if a therapist is watching your lecture, uh, uh, any message based on your experience that you would like to say from tomorrow, every patient with lumbar spine dysfunction, don't miss this. Um, motor control, motor control, motor control. Motor control. Because yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I know, motor, yeah, it is a new area of research and it's not that uh, often regarded how it should be. And we never think that way because when we say, when a patient comes in and we give them as strengthening exercises for home exercise program, I unfortunately, I don't believe in that. I believe in stability. So make the joint as stable as possible. Then you go in for with your mobility, strengthening, endurance, and blah. what the individuals are doing is correct, but maybe jumping steps. So let's not jump steps. Go step by step and then do your strengthening. That would be more fruitful from patient perspective. Right, right. I think uh, you've given more than somebody could have expected. Uh, and we thank I always you do for, that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we thank you for that. Thank you for well, most welcome. Us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Dr. Thank Agarwal. You. Thank you, Dr. Pandey, for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you and, you know, share our knowledge and uh, that's how we all grow together grow and develop together and um, let me know if i can be of any assistance so thank you so much thank, thank you, you thank you Dr. thanks thank you have a good night bye good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.